on the bear cams in Katmai National Park, Alaska, we watch bears work to satisfy their profound hunger. Each bear is an individual with a personality and habits unique to it. But an individual bear does not live in a vacuum. It is connected to and influenced by its neighbors and its environment. The converse happens as well. Bears are not passive observers in the processes happening around them. They are a physical force for change that shapes habitat for themselves and other organisms. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Fitz, the resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Welcome to this live chat about brown bears and their ecological engineering abilities. Joining me is my co-host, Katmai National Park Ranger, Felicia Jimenez. Great to speak with you again, Felicia. And I think the idea for this uh, live chat was yours, wasn't it? Yeah, it's something I'm really excited to talk about. It's a new, con uh, a new program that we have to offer. And if you have uh, questions for Felicia and I about the ecological roles of bears and maybe how they influence uh, the ecosystems that they are a part of, then you can drop those into the comments. We'll have a helpful moderator from Explore.org uh, sending those in our direction. We'll try to get to some of those during the broadcast uh, today. To start though, Felicia, yeah, I, I tend to think of humans as maybe the archetypal mm -hmm. example of a species that engineers habitats for their own benefit. But many other species have this capacity. Sometimes in obvious ways they do it, and sometimes they do it in very subtle ways. So maybe uh, can you introduce us to the concept of an ecosystem engineer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. If you've never heard of this term before, um, an ecosystem engineer is a term that's used a lot in the science of ecology. And the basic definition of what an ecosystem engineer is, is a species that modifies, maintains, or creates habitat for themselves and for other species. Um, and ecosystem engineers are really, really cool species. They can be big, they can be small, um, and they are so, so important into an ecosystem ecosystem because they contribute to biodiversity, to species richness. Um, without ecosystem engineers, our ecosystems aren't as balanced and they're a lot more homogenous. So they put in a lot of, um, yes, uh, what's called heterogeneity into the ecosystem and they play really, really big roles. Um, ecosystem engineers can be split into two main types. Um, the first type we're going to talk about are allogenic engineers. So these types of ecosystem engineers physically change the materials in their habitat. Um, a classic example that we have in our Brooks River ecosystem are beavers. Um, beavers are the classic example of ecosystem engineers. And in this cool video from the underwater cam, we see a beaver um, swimming around. Um, they're definitely a force in our ecosystem here. Um, and beavers are ecosystem engineers because they alter rivers and streams with their dams. Um, they create salmon habitat by creating wetlands. Um, and trees that they cut down when they overhang over streams, and they provide salmon fry with really critical habitat that they need. Um, beavers are such an important part of the Brooks River ecosystem. They shape a lot. Here is a beaver that we're seeing around the falls cam. Um, it's really cool and they put in little guest appearances and we can see them on the cams. Um, and they're, they're a really big force in a shape. Um, but yeah, beavers are super important in the Brooks River ecosystem. So what about all the other charismatic wildlife that we also know and love and see on the cams? Um, let's talk about bears. <laughs> Bears are an example of allogenic engineers, and they alter their environment through a variety of behaviors that we're going to discuss later in the program. Um, but another key um, species that we see a lot on the cam that shape this are salmon. They're ecosystem engineers. And Mike, I know you really want to talk about salmon. It, yeah, the salmon, I, I think both of us find salmon to be extraordinarily mm -hmm. fascinating animals and one of the, th the ways that they are fascinating is <clears throat> is how they reproduce and how they dig their their nests and what effect that has on streams and rivers that they inhabit the digging of nests by salmon might seem inconsequential beyond mm -hmm. anything but the reproductive success of the species but given enough time uh, over thousands of generations and millions of salmon nest digging can create 
great change. A female salmon digs one nest, uh, she spawns some of her eggs in it, and then she moves upstream slightly to dig another. The process repeats until she's exhausted her eggs. Her series of nests are called a red, that is spelled R-E-D-D, -D, and her work changes the topography of the river bottom by creating a series of dune-like depressions and hummocks on the stream bed, which you can kind of see in this footage from the upper uh, Brooks River. This is right where the river begins, and this is this spawning activity is probably uh, happening there right at this time of the year. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of like dune-like features that salmon create on the river bottom through their spawning efforts are unstable compared to the undug river bottom, where sediment uh, is, is, has not been altered by the digging activity of the fish. So uh, sometimes salmon can also remove enough sediment where it's uh, thin enough that um, it can expose bedrock to greater erosive forces of water over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in a paper uh, titled Sex That Moves Mountains, which is, which is not an adult film scre screenplay written by geologists, <laughs> it was actually published in the journal Geomorphology. The researchers in that study, they modeled the erosive power of salmon uh, over geologic time scales. And they found that, that nest digging by salmon alters the profile of stream beds, making them uh, more concave in profile uh, from like the headwaters up in a mountain, for instance, down to where they might uh, empty into, uh, into the ocean. Uh, and that is, was especially true, they found, in places with more than one uh, species of salmon, because different species of salmon select nest sites with different rock and sediment sizes. In turn, this process can create different spawning habitats I, uh, that may have promoted maybe the radiation of different salmon species from a common ancestor. So I found that I found that really fascinating. I thought that was a great example of how um, a, uh, a fish can be an ecological engineer in a, in a sense. It's hard to imagine a salmon's tail could be the driver that imparts great change on the river, but uh, there mm -hmm. seems to be pretty good evidence for it. And Felicia, when we think long term, uh, when we consider how small changes lead to big changes mm -hmm. over time, then the implications of these ecological engineering species start to make sense. These changes, though, aren't mm -hmm. limited to organisms uh, by changing habitats. They, they also create them. And there's a different maybe type of ecological engineer in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just talked about allogenic engineers, um, but there is a second type of ecological engineer, and those are autogenic engineers. So like Mike said, um, instead of changing the habitat around them and their surroundings, autogenic engineers change themselves. Um, another classic example of an autogenic engineer are trees. Um, trees create habitat for other species and birds, and you can see um, this eagle that's in this tree right now. Um, trees create, you know, they change themselves as their trunk expands, as they grow more um, you know, branches, they create habitat for other species like birds and insects. So they are a classic example of an autogenic engineer. Um, another example of autogenic engineers that also change themselves, we don't have these in the Brooks River ecosystem, um, but kelp is another example, beautiful kelp forests. Um, as these, you know, as the kelp grow and stretch towards the sun, um, they're reaching towards the light. They provide such rich habitat for a number of marine species, um, including seals, like we're seeing swimming on this camera right now. Um, and yeah, we don't have kelp in the Brooks River ecosystem, but they're just another good example when you're talking about autogenic engineers. And Felicia, let's let's talk more about how bears can engineer habitats. Uh, you mentioned trees just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. uh, bears, they're big, powerful animals. Uh, mm -hmm. They could wreck a lot of trees if they wanted to, <laughs> and they do. Uh, they do mark a lot of trees, so they have an uncanny mm -hmm. ability to impart change on certain plants, uh, such as trees. Yeah, um, trees, um, bears make their mark on trees. Um, bears actually use trees in a variety of different ways. Um, they use they mark trees as a social behavior to signal to other bears that they're around, maybe to signal for mating opportunities. And sometimes they'll go back to the same tree repeatedly and rub up against it. Um, 
and tree rubbing and that that damage that bears you know give to trees like we're seeing um this bear rub up against this tree um, scratching a nice itch um this behavior creates niches for insects and birds so it's creating another role for insects and birds um in this and then we're seeing another bear gnawing on the tree um maybe ripping some bark off um, there's actually been quite a few studies done on um, damage that bears do to trees. There's this really interesting study um, done on brown bears in the Polish Eastern Carpathians and other mountain range um, that shows by bears, um, trees that are damaged by bears marking them or stripping them like you're seeing in this video right now. Here's another bear scratching a nice itch. Um, it leaves damage on those trees, but that um, those trees make the best habitat for insects because it strips some of that bark. Um, it makes those trees the best place, um, consequently then, for birds that eat those insects that are going into those trees, especially woodpeckers to forage. Um, I know in that study, they pointed towards um, that mountain range being habitat for 10 species of woodpeckers. And you could find those woodpeckers in those areas that bears have been marking on and damaging those trees. Um, and these forests are harvested commercially. Um, but in this study, these scientists actually recommended leaving all of these trees that these bears had damaged, you know, over years and years, um, leaving them be for future forestry applications. So they're telling, you know, their forestry department, don't harvest these trees damaged by the bears, leave them. They're better for the ecosystem overall. So we're really seeing, even just by rubbing up against the tree, how much um, bears can shape their environment. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of a, like, a less forceful way that bears, you know, use trees. But they also have another behavior that we see bears do a lot, and they just take down trees. <laughs> in this really fun video that you're seeing, you're seeing 32 chum jumping on a tree branch. Um, and by doing that, that can also have an ecosystem benefit. Um, by bears even just taking down trees, especially in forests that have a lot of tree canopy cover, it increases the light available on the forest floor for other species. Uh, or just take down trees because they want to take down trees, but it can have really good benefits. There's a really interesting study um, done on Japanese black bears um, that showed that the trees taken down um, by the bears, they open up, you know, gaps in the canopy. And as these bears are climbing these trees, um, they accidentally take down a branch or they take down a tree itself. It opens up gaps of light to reach the floor um, and then as they're eating that fruit um, you know they drop the seeds and this light that comes through the canopy reaches germinating seeds um, so that means more fruit trees are um, you know growing which the bears favor so it's great for the trees and it's great for the bears um, and these bears are shaping their environment by direct action. So maybe that's marking or taking down trees, damaging tree limbs. Um, but they also shape their environment indirectly. Um, after they've taken down a tree limb or just like gnaw on a branch like this guy is doing, um, they are still continuing to shape their ecosystem and maybe they take down a tree limb and start foraging on the fruit. Um, but even after they start eating the fruit, they continue to shape their ecosystem indirectly. So Mike, do you wanna tell us what happens next after the bears fill their bellies with that fruit? Well, this is when the, all the fun happens, right? <laughs> you know, what, one way that we can begin to understand how bears act as ecological engineers is by thinking about their movements through the landscape and what they carry with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, bears love to eat berries. Many berry plants produce fruit that are high in sugar and also contain a substantial amount of protein. So berries are one of the absolute best foods that a brown bear can eat. And, and brown bears and black bears in North America, they do it very well. One study in Southeast Alaska found that bears for, foraging on the fruits of Devil's Club plants, they, could, they, they did that so efficiently in this study area near Haines, Alaska, that a single bear could eat an estimated 100,000 berries per hour within the, the, that study's uh, area. So, uh, I mean, that's an amazing amount of berries. Devil's Club is present in Katmai, 
but it's not widespread and it, it occurs primarily like in pockets along the Pacific coast of a park. It's not available to bears in the Brooks River area, as far as I know, but other berry species are uh, like blueberries. You'll find blueberries on uh, Dumpling Mountain mm -hmm. behind Felicia. Uh, they're in the background and bears are good at foraging on them efficiently. Late August and September is the season when blueberries typically ripen around Brooks River and Naknat mm -hmm. Lake. While, uh, you know, the bears are eating berries, they're pulling nutrition from them in the form of sugar and protein. Yet the actual seeds pass through a bear's digestive system relatively unscathed. Mm -hmm. They maybe get etched a little bit by some acid, some stomach acid, but that might actually be beneficial for germination. And through uh, foraging and then wandering and subsequent bowel movements, bears are a significant disperser of seeds. The, the authors mm -hmm. of the study that I mentioned earlier about uh, bears and devil's club calculated that bears can ultimately disperse 200,000 seeds uh, from an hour's worth of foraging through their scat. And after a bear has been feeding on blueberries, its scat is deposited, uh, maybe, or is depositing maybe similar amounts of blueberry seeds in a nutrient rich growing mm -hmm. medium. And I wonder if this activity helps plants colonize new habitats or become more abundant in habitats than they would be otherwise, like uh, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, which you see part of right here. This area was formed uh, during the 1912 eruption of Novarupta in Mount Katmai. This was the largest volcanic eruption of the 1900s. It's an approximately 40 square mile area of barren ash and pumice. Its original soil surface was buried deeply and ash was so hot that it killed really anything underneath. The return of plants therefore had to be assisted by wind or animals. In, the, in this area, I have found uh, blueberry clusters growing many miles from the mountains where they would have survived the eruption. Uh, blueberries themselves are generally too heavy to be dispersed by wind. So I think it's likely an animal helped them to get there. Uh, might bear scat have sown the seeds for blueberry plants in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes? because I find them way out there near the eruptive center itself. Uh, and, and might one day this area become a tundra that is rich in berries because of the work of bears. And might bears make the area more habitable for themselves and other animals as a result? I don't know, uh, but bears have the ability to change plant communities through their foraging ac activities. And, and there's a chain reaction caused by this. Bear scats filled with seeds are visited by small mammals who further disperse seeds and we have an audience question uh, i don't know if i can find it right now but somebody was wondering about um if bears have an effect on other wildlife uh for instance mm -hmm. and that is certainly true because with um with uh, you know the piles of scat they leave behind and the piles of seeds that are within them uh the bear scats are are, are visited by small mammals that further collect and disperse seeds uh, the, this subsidizes the food available to small rodents like voles who might survive at higher densities because of seed uh, availability in bear scat. So bear scat, it, it carries seeds with them, carries a lot more as well. And when bears are foraging on salmon, like at Brooks River, the bears become vectors that transfer nutrients from the ocean into terrestri terrestrial habitats. So when we're watching salmon at Brooks Falls, you can think of those fish uh, not just as a bundle of energy, for a predator like a bear, but also a pulse of nutrients. Think of these fish as a sack mm -hmm. of fertilizer. Uh, when bears catch fish and bring them onto land, any leftovers decompose and fertilize uh, the plants that are nearby. Bear urine, salmon filled bear scat, transports uh, you know these nutrients from salmon far from the boundaries of, of spawning streams. And the scat decomposes and the water filters through it. Uh, it fertilizes the plants and in areas that they may not otherwise have access to the nutrients contained um, within within salmon. And several scientific studies have found that plants grow faster in areas with spawning salmon compared to nearby places where salmon are not found. So simply by foraging, mm -hmm. bears are making habitat uh, changes. They're making their habitats different and they're making them richer as well. And uh, Felicia, since bears are omnivores, they forage across different mm -hmm. levels of the food chain. So it's just not like up at the top where they're feeding maybe on like a moose carcass or something or, or like salmon, but it's also way down at the bottom where they're feeding on berries and other plants. And um, mm -hmm. most bear populations survive largely on plant-based diets. Um, so I'm wondering how are their acts of foraging also part of their engineering skills? And there was an audience question related to this as well. Uh, somebody was wondering, mm -hmm. Do the bears erode uh, the ecosystem when they dig and push trees around? So maybe that's something that you could talk about as you're talking about um, how bears are, are actively digging 
uh, when they're moving through the landscape. Yeah, this is a perfect audience question that segues into talking about bears digging. Um, bears love to dig, um, and that hump that's on their back helps them dig. It's a behavior we see a lot on the cams. Um, it's a behavior we see a lot in camp. Um, this video that you're seeing is Bear 901. She's in camp a lot. This is from a lot earlier in the season. Um, and here she is. She's digging at the base of a spruce tree, trying to dig up um, some spruce roots. So she is foraging um, for food right here. And so definitely bear she, she the hole is still there actually um i walk past it every day um and so according to a study done in glacier national park bears digging helps them aerate the soil it's actually like has benefits to the ecosystem with them digging um here's 480 digging a day bed um and it's it does it benefits um it benefits the ecosystem. In this study, um, there was a meadow that is frequently dug up by bears. And when they tested the soil in this area, um, it was found to be a lot more nitrogen rich, which is a vital growing condition for glacier lilies. Um, in Glacier National Park, these grizzly bears are foraging on glacier lily bulbs. Um, and aerated nitrogen rich soil is very important for these um, bulbs, you know, to grow and bears dig up the soil to get to those bulbs. Um, so in turn, their digging helps aerate the soil and makes it more nitrogen rich, um, which makes it better for glacier lilies to grow. So they are helping both the lilies by giving them ideal habitat to grow. And they're helping themselves because more um, glacier lilies grow in this meadow. There was another meadow, you know, next to it that was the control in the study that bears didn't disturb and the meadow that the bears did disturb the lilies there were so many more in that field versus the control one um so bears also continue to return to that same meadow year after year because there are more you know lilies available so definitely um digging helps aerate the soil sometimes like it also shapes maybe it erodes the riverbank a little bit more which we'll talk about later um but digging helps the soil by aerating it so we've seen you know so far in this program how bears shape the forest how they shape the meadows and the ground that they walk on and so now let's talk about the resource that they've come to brooks um camp specifically to use mike um let's talk about how bears use brooks river and how they shape it yeah you know when i think one of the conspicuous examples of how bears are shaping um the river is just downstream mm -hmm. of brooks falls there's a small flat mound of gravel that is uh, distance wise, it's maybe like 30 or 40 feet downstream of the falls. If you started watching the cams this year, you might not have thought anything at all about this space unless a bear was resting there or using it for some other reason. In the 1990s though, that patch of gravel was fully vegetated. So in this photograph from the early 1990s, you can see that island and how it's covered in tall willows. And when I arrived at Brooks River in 2007, that island didn't have as many tall shrubs on it, but it still contained a few willows that were that were quite tall and it was covered in, fully in grass. The vegetation on the island survived back then, even though more than 100 bears were identified at the river per year, like in 2007 and 2008 and 2009. By 2016 though, there was definitely, it seems like there was a shift happening. Uh, when mm -hmm. I captured this video of Otis marking one of the last surviving willows on the island, it remained you know, again, as you can see, largely vegetated, despite the work of bears. By 2018, though, the large willow on the island was no more, and the marking activity of mm -hmm. bears uh, was, was too much for most of the plants there. Especially during recent years, uh, the erosive force of bears seems to impact vegetation on the island, beyond which uh, that a threshold which that the vegetation could recover from. So without bears, uh, you know, I think today the island would have remained covered in plants. It has no plants on it mm -hmm. at all. But without bears, I, I think it would have been fully vegetated today. Maybe it could have had supported small trees, might have even expanded in size as plant roots grew into the ground, as the roots held organic matter and they promoted soil accumulation. Mm -hmm. So the physical actions of bears serve as an agent of change, especially in areas where bears gather mm -hmm. and travel 
in uh, large numbers. And we have other examples of that, Felicia, um, including I think mm -hmm. another audience question that might segue into what you wanna talk about next. And this person uh, asks, will brown bears flip logs and rocks to expose grubs or insects, or is that just a thing that um, Timon and Pumbaa do from The Lion King? <laughs> They they will actually to if you know they're in an area where they you know eat insects and that's a very valuable food source they're definitely going to do that um, they certainly have the power to do that um, yeah bears are a powerful force um, and actually those pictures that you were showing Mike were super interesting like just the sh the sheer use of them has eroded that island um, and. This also like leads to segue into like the next part of it is bears are just through shaping too. There are other parts of the falls that, you know, we see um, bears like scaling the wall over by the falls, just their use and the consistent traffic up and down. Um, they change the way that the river moves. Um, so look at this very fun video of a bear 747 scaling that massive wall right next to the falls. Um, just take a look at everything around it, right? So to the right of him, there's vegetation, um, but then everything else, there's nothing that's growing there. Um, and you can see the riverbank kind of slowly eroding into it. And this is just purely by bear traffic. Um, but I mean, it's not surprising at all if 747 was walking up and down this wall all the time. Um, I'm surprised that there really is even a wall there. Um, but when bears gather in large numbers at the fall, we at the falls we can see how they're shaping the the bank of the river. Um, and yeah, nothing grows there anymore. Like it's it's a fascinating place to watch. It's just through their traffic, through that use, we see how bears are shaping the boundaries of the river. Um, and so when we look at how bears alter their environment to benefit themselves and others, we tend to think of the big things, these big things like this, like bears scaling the walls and tree canopies altered, um, meadows dug up and holes dug up, um, entire river banks that are shaped and changed. But there's a massive ecosystem um, that exists in everything on earth that we all have access to. And that's our microbiome. So let's zoom in to a much smaller scale of an ecosystem. And bears are certainly shaping their own microbiome. So Mike, do you wanna talk about what's going on inside of a bear's gut? Yeah, this has also been um, something I've been reading about in preparation for this, this broadcast. And it, I, I find it uh, quite yeah. interesting. You know, we can think about, um, you know, along the lines of uh, auto, autogenic engineers, you know, mammals have, you know, mm -hmm. big digestive tracts. Um, each individual uh, animal is home to a trillions of microorganisms living in symbiosis or not in the case of parasites like tapeworms, which, which brown bears have. Uh, but generally in symbiosis with their host, um, this affects, uh, you know, their survival. Um, and we discussed how bears cause physical changes to their environment. But in a sense, they're also, again, ecosystems in their own right. Uh, the microorganisms in a bear's gastrointestinal tract um, are, are what I like to call a gut microbiome or a gut fauna. And when humans have this as well, it's basically just the animals living in your digestive tract. Uh, they facilitate energy uptake by the host. They also help with vitamin synthesis. And even there's pretty good evidence in people that they help with the host's immune response. Uh, brown bears are mammals, of course, uh, but they're different uh, than people in that they only eat during part of the year. They don't eat du during hibernation. This affects uh, their gut fauna in some pretty uh, unique ways. And one study published in 2013 found that the gut fauna of bears differs between um, a bear's active season and its hibernation seasons. Some of the end products of digestion were also different across the year for a bear. Uh, for example, hibernating bears had more cholesterol in their blood um, than they do during uh, the summertime when they are active, even though they're not eating anything in the wintertime. The same study also found that when mice were inoculated with gut fauna from a bear, the mice were able to gain more body fat. This led the authors to hypothesize that a bear's gut fauna promotes fat in energy storage when a, when a bear is actively feeding. 
And then another study that I was reading uh, recently from 2022 found that bears and cat might have a more diverse gut fauna community compared to their cousins living farther north in get to the Arctic National Park in northern Alaska. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was due to the greater diversity of foods available for cat mice bears. Uh, and the bears and cat mice also had uh, significant differences in gut fauna communities compared with bears in Lake Clark National Park, which is a national park very close to cat mice with many similar habitats. So it seems like maybe bears host a gut fauna that's complementary to their home area and what they're eating. The author, authors also suggest that uh, by monitoring gut fauna of bears over time, really, and that would, that would be like nothing more than collecting the scat and looking at it in the laboratory, uh, that can, prov can provide clues about environmental fluctuations that might affect brown bear health. Could lead us to understand changes in a bear's diet that might be hard to observe otherwise. And, um, you know, if we are able to protect the full range of diversity among individual bears, including individual gut fauna diversity, then that might help, uh, mm -hmm. that may help ensure that brown bear populations remain resilient when facing environmental uh, changes. And as I was reading all of this too, one final thought that I had is, is about the idea of self, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, we can, should consider how organisms are ecosystems unto themselves. People included, if my digestive system is feeling unwell, I sometimes wonder if I did anything to make my little buddies inside of me unwell. And and that's maybe a little bit of a contrast to like, a, you know, a, the perspective of, of many people, including my earlier self, when, uh, you know, uh, we have a, like a fundamental understanding of what self is. And, you know, that is each one of us understands that we are a separate being distinguished from others. And I, I don't wish to get into a philosophical debate over the meaning of self. That's for smarter people than I to try to figure out. Uh, however, our dis digestive system contains trillions of organisms that help us process food and nutrients and keep harmful microorganisms at bay. Uh, so I, I do wonder rhetorically, you know, what is the meaning of self when we can't survive without the help of other creatures that are inhabiting our bodies? And, and Felicia, this is one of the many lines of evidence that has convinced me that humans are not separate from nature and we never were. And mm -hmm. as we consider how wildlife affects us, it's also important to consider how we influence uh, the behavior of wildlife, including how bears respond to human causes or human cause changes on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, definitely. That's actually why I love the science of ecology so much because it studies these relationships. Um, and, you know, so we're seeing part of it is how are bears shaping their ecosystems despite the fact that humans often alter their ecosystems um, bears still have to survive um, and they are still actively shaping and working with these challenges so for some challenges that they have experienced um, there was this um, you know study done about bears that are still foraging in plantations um, and monocultures when humans cut down um, trees and they clear cut forests and then they plant plantations um, tree plantations um, bears are still altering their diets um, and they're changing so there was a study done um, about japanese black bears um, and how they dig for cicadas they've altered their diets um, in this um, human altered environment where the plants that they normally eat are gone now and they only are living you know among these plantations in an ecosystem um, in a monoculture so they've shifted their diets um, and they start digging um, like in this video where we're seeing 480 dig his day bed um, these bears are digging underneath these trees um, and shifting to eating cicadas and shifting to more of an insect-based diet versus a plant-based diet. Um, so bears shifted their diets towards cicadas and they started to dig at the base of these trees to search for cicadas. Um, and once again, aerating the soil, adding nitrogen into the soil, um, making it better for the trees that were growing on the plantations and also easier access for cicadas into these dug up holes. Um, so it makes it better for all of the life around it, but also makes it just an easier food source for bears to access when humans have altered their environment. Um, and this, this study kind of shows us that even with the challenges of humans altering their environment, bears are going to find a way to persist and survive. 
Um, they are remarkable animals with the ability to adapt even in extreme challenges of humans altering their landscape. Um, and it's been really, really fun to discuss um, just and I could talk all day about how bears um, shape the ecology of the Brooks River ecosystem, but I think we wanted to get to some audience questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. We um, definitely have time for some audience questions. We've had some great ones come in uh, so far. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I guess one of, the, one of the questions that we got in advance that is applicable to this mm -hmm. topic, Felicia, is about brown bears and maybe how they affect the presence of other other animals in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, so this person wrote in, uh, if brown bears didn't frequent Brooks River, do you think we would mm -hmm. see other predators like wolves here more often during the summer months? What do you what mm -hmm. what are your uh, thoughts on that? I think that's a really interesting question because it opens up what is. Um, the niche that bears fill in this ecosystem. So a niche is like the role that an animal or an organism plays. Um, and with bears, we have this huge niche that's filled by a very large population of brown bears. Um, so for whatever reason, bears were not here. I definitely feel like there's a possibility that we could see other predators or other large animals step in and kind of fill in that niche because we have this you know, large food source. Um, and wolves are seen here, um, you know, in the Brooks River ecosystem. We, they're a lot more cryptic. They're hard to see. Um, but a big reason on why we don't see them is because there's just so many bears around. But we do see them from time to time, and we do see them grab fish from time to time. So maybe if we didn't have brown bears um, frequenting this river, maybe other predators definitely, like wolves or something else would step in to fill in that niche. Yeah, there are so many variables to consider along those lines too. Um, like the, mm -hmm. the presence of people, you know, maybe the wolves mm -hmm. in the area just like, hey, I don't like the, um, you know, the presence of too many people, the noise, so they're, maybe they're a little bit uncomfortable with that. Maybe, you mm -hmm. know, the, the experiment would be if there were no bears and no people, then we might see if mm -hmm. like wolves are able to take um, advantage of, the, of that opportunity. Uh, you know, because mm -hmm. one of the, the tenets of ecology is that no two species completely overlap in their niche. Uh, they are, they do, mm -hmm. there is many, there is much overlap, right? But not complete overlap. And that allows these different mm -hmm. species to survive in the same, same habitats. So yeah, I wonder, because we know um, bears uh, fish for salmon, they dominate access to the best fishing spots in a lot of places. And we know that wolves feed on salmon in Katmai and throughout the Alaska mm -hmm. Peninsula and, and much of um, you know coastal Alaska. So yeah, it, it would be interesting to, to see what would happen. Um, but I, yeah, I think there would be an opportunity for wolves to learn to take advantage of fish in, in more places because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, Felicia, we talked about um, bears digging. Uh, you know, we had some footage of Otis, mm -hmm. you know, uh, preparing his day bed, which he's been returning to frequently, mm -hmm. not exclusively, but he's been going back there frequently. Um, so somebody was wondering, uh, where are the bears when they aren't fishing? And do they have each have their own uh, beds? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, that's a, such a common question because the cams only capture just a small, you know, sliver of their lives. Um, so where are the bears at when they're not on the river and they're not fishing? Um, they might be visiting other food sources, um, especially in the month of August, right? Um, it's bears are here with the salmon run. Um, so as salmon, um, you know, move up the river and move through Naknek Lake and all these other streams and tributaries, um, bears are going to follow the food. So they might be on a walkabout, they might be out, um, you know, somewhere else. Um, when they're not fishing and they've, you know, filled up, they're going to dig and make day beds somewhere off camera, somewhere that's in a more hidden location, um, and just take a nap and snooze it off. They also might be foraging too. Um, salmon make up the majority of their diets, um, especially during, you know, the months of July and September, but they're also subsisting on grasses um, in June. And then especially in August, they're going after those berries like we talked about in the program earlier. Um, so lots of places they could be going and lots of other food sources they could be, you know, um, feeding on. And one of the, one of the points that we made during the broadcast earlier was about how, um, bears can affect other other wildlife 
Um, we just mm -hmm. mentioned a moment ago about like bears of wolves and we discussed some hypotheticals associated with that. Uh, but somebody wrote in and was wondering, we see gulls attracted to bears for food. What other animals are mm -hmm. affected positively or negatively by the presence of bears in the ecosystem? You know, I mentioned before about uh, bear scat and how it contains a lot of seeds and how rodents can take advantage mm -hmm. of that. They can, you know, they find these big piles of seeds in a decomposed pile of bear scat that's available to them. And then along Brooks River, uh, Felicia, I know that when I've been there, the, the number of bald eagles increases when the salmon arrive. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because mm -hmm. the, the bears make the salmon available to the eagles. Because like a, a five pound sockeye salmon is a huge catch for a bald eagle. Bald eagles are big, powerful mm -hmm. birds, but they typically can't fly away with like a whole five pound fish. So maybe uh, mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about how eagles um, are, are benefiting from, uh, from bears sort of uh, par only partly eating salmon? Yeah, um, you know, bears, they don't, some, a lot of times they don't eat the whole salmon. Um, and yeah, a five, you know, eight pound sockeye salmon as big as this, you know, eagle is in the top corner, um, it's not going to eat that entire thing. Um, but they will, you know, come up and scoop up even like a half eaten salmon is a great meal for an eagle. And basically, as long as it can fit it um, and fly away with it, they're going to take it. So that's definitely a positive benefit to these bears with their presence. It's also really fascinating, too, that in the Brooks River area, in the Knack Knack Lake area, birds like gulls and bald eagles will delay their nesting time uh, compared to other parts of North America to correspond with like uh, the arrival of the fish. So their, their eggs and their chicks hatch mm -hmm. right around the time salmon start to become available because all of a sudden that's like this, this uh, burst of food that's available to them. Mm -hmm. And partly that's made, you know, even more accessible um, by the bears. So yeah, the, the salmon in a, in a sense are, uh, we, we talked about this in other programs, they are the, the keystones of the ecosystem and bears are helping to facilitate uh, you know, the, the benefits of salmon uh, to, to other animals. Uh, what about, what about insects, uh, Felicia, you know, insects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in cat mind, the, the ones that people tend to notice the most happen to be uh, like the biting insects. So the black flies, which are locally in your area called white socks, <laughs> uh, the abundant mosquitoes, mm -hmm. no I mean, they can all, they can all be present at various times during the summer. Um, are insects, uh, somebody was wondering, are insects considered eco ecosystem engineers? <laughs> insects are definitely considered ecosystem engineers. There's no size limit to, uh, you know, how big or, uh, you know, an animal an ecosystem engineer has to be. You know, for the insects, we're the, eco <laughs> we're the ecosystem, um, especially the biting ones, we're their food source. Um, but in terms of like classic examples of an insect that's an ecosystem engineer, I think of bees as a great example, especially carpenter bees, the bees that, um, you know, burrow underground and they make holes in trees and like it, they are such a great example of an ecosystem engineer. So definitely don't just limit it to big animals like bears. Um, insects can definitely be them. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the like uh, the the social insects in um, mm -hmm. in temperate and tropical regions, ants, termites, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's. I think there's. I've only seen a few ants in in Cap. It doesn't seem like they're like a huge part yeah, of that, seen any. that Arctic Arctic ecosystem up there. So there's mm -hmm. there's hardly any there. But yeah, if you're in temperate parts of North America, I mean, ants kind of run the mm -hmm. world. So, so yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we we talk about mammals being ecosystem engineers, but yeah, it's it's um it's the insects and, and especially some of those social insects like ants, in my opinion, that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, let's see, uh, oh, we yeah. have a few other questions <laughs> we can try to get to um, before the end of our broadcast. Uh, I mentioned, of course, about bear scat. We talked about that mm -hmm. um, and seeds and things like that. But this is the time of the year, though, Felicia for tapeworms. So, uh, you know, the gut <laughs> fauna uh, that help benefit bears, it's not all beneficial. I mean, there's stuff in there that is parasitic <laughs> like tapeworms. Um, so somebody was wondering, uh, can you tell us what part the bears play in the life cycle of tapeworms? And if we know whether their health is ever impacted 
uh, by them. <laughs> Yeah, tapeworms. Um, it's definitely not all beneficial. I know we focus on like, definitely mutualistic relationships um, within an ecosystem, but there are parasitic ones and tapeworms are a great example. Um, it's pretty common, especially, you know, around July um, and August when bears are consuming a ton of salmon. Um, it's very common to have visitors be like, what is that? Thing that is coming out of that bear's butt. Did it eat a string? Did it eat a rope? Like, nope, nope. I'm so sorry to tell you, you are looking in this video at like a four or five foot long tapeworm. Um, <laughs> it's so gross. Um, but that is definitely one of the relationships that exists in the Katmai ecosystem. So bears will consume the salmon and sockeye salmon, unfortunately, have a lot of parasites in them. I think like out of a all the other salmon species they are have about like a pretty high chance of having parasites in them and tapeworms being one of them so bear will eat the salmon and then the tapeworm um will come in and you know it'll be the eggs and then eventually that tapeworm will just grow and grow and grow inside of that bear's gut um and then bears will hopefully just poop them out um or sometimes you'll see those those cases where a tapeworm is hanging out of a bear's butt. Um, and for the most part, it seems like it doesn't really affect the bears all too much. A bear will usually pass it, you know, through bowel movement. Um, they don't really offer any benefits to, um, like the bear's not getting any benefits from the tapeworm. Um, they're just along for the ride. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I don't think the the ecological associations of tapeworms have been that well studied. Mostly, they've been mm -hmm. studied uh, in the context of like impacting mammalian health, for for instance. So, like either in people mm -hmm. or other um, or, or carnivores, for instance. Uh, but I think every bear probably in Katmai that has been eating salmon, which is virtually all of them, they probably all have tapeworms at at this time of the year. I. There, I think there must be some other ecological links associated with tapeworms, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe because they, they release a lot of eggs, you know, at this time of the year, maybe mm -hmm. those eggs are eaten by microorganisms or small fish or something like that. Um, I know that eventually like the, um, the first stage in a tapeworms life cycle is that it's eaten by a piece of plank or um, a spe you know, certain types of plankton, that plankton gets mm -hmm. eaten by salmon fry. And then that's when the, um, the tapeworm cyst is able to develop within a salmon and just kind of wait there until a mammal happens to uh, come along and, and eat the salmon itself. Um, a related question to this along tapeworms, uh, the long, long, the line, the long, long lines of tapeworms is uh, do tapeworms leave bears before they hibernate? Can, ta can tapeworms starve uh, a hibernating bear? Uh, I don't, I don't think that a hibernating bear has to worry about harm from a tapeworm. Uh, because one of the interesting things about tapeworms is that they don't have a mouth. They are, they're so long and they're so thin, they have a tremendous amount of surface area compared to their volume because they are living in a soup of nutrients. And if you're basically living in your food, you do not need uh, to have a mouth part at all. You can basically just sort of absorb that straight through your body, you know, all those different body segments. So that's what tapeworms are doing. Since so they don't have a mouth and bears aren't eating um, in hibernation, basically their digestive tract is empty. Um, so bears might shed all of uh, their tapeworms before they go into hibernation. I don't think um, there's any evidence that a tapeworm can, can harm a, a hibernating bear because there's just nothing in the digestive tract for um, tapeworms um, mm -hmm. that to, to, to eat overall. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on this, Felicia. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't think that they're going to hurt a bear. Um, there's nothing in their digestive tract. You know, we know the bears are subsisting off of their, their fat, um, and that's not anything that the tapeworms are interested in. So I totally agree with you. All right. If we have a few minutes left in our broadcast here, maybe a f uh, we'll try to get to a couple of more questions. Um, this one is not necessarily along the lines of ecosystem engineers, but it, it's a, a fun one to, to answer anyway. Because we've talked about how if you're walking along the trails of Brooks River, sometimes you can smell a bear if a bear's been in the vicinity recently. Um, so somebody was wondering uh, if, you, if a bear's fallen asleep along the trail, you can smell it. So what do bears smell like? What's your experience been like, Felicia? 
<laughs> if I can smell a bear, um, honestly, I smell their scat before anything else. <laughs> anything else um it's not a pleasant smell and also depending on what they're eating it smells so different right. like fishy like bear scat smells completely different than like bear scat in june when it's all full of grass it looks like like what a horse you know passes um bears in general i don't they when you pass by i guess it can smell if if it's a wet bear it's i guess kind of like a wet dog smell but like more woody i don't, I don't know how to describe it um, but scat before anything is what i notice more <laughs> yeah i agree with that uh, the 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 scat that's full mostly of like green veg in the springtime when they're feeding on mm -hmm. grasses for example it doesn't really have a strong odor that I have experienced, but yeah, when they're when they're feeding mm -hmm. on salmon at this time of the year, it is it's pretty nasty stuff. This is actually this photo here is a pretty um, that's a pretty clean pile, <laughs> um, comparatively mm -hmm. speaking. Uh, so it, it's not pleasant, uh, and yeah, I, yeah, it's it's like um if a bear's been laying in like a day bed for a long time and it leaves and you happen to walk mm -hmm. by soon afterwards, to me it smells like a combination of like wet dog and and fish slime. Um, because they're, they're in the water mm -hmm. eating fish all the time and you know the water washes some of that off but the odor uh, can i think remain uh, let's see if we have get to any any more questions here um we can yeah one one question that came in fairly early is about salmon and ecosystem engineers we covered a little bit of that uh during the process um felicia but maybe you could really briefly recap for the audience why salmon are so important, why they are keystones for uh, the, the Brooks River and, and the Katmai ecosystems. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually love the title of the study that you referenced earlier, um, Salmon Like Move Mountains or something like that, um, because they really and truly do. So this salmon that is digging, it's red right now. Um, it shapes, you know, the bottom of the riverbed. Um, it brings sediment up into um, the water. And, you know, I've noticed, um, especially, you know, like the last, you know, week or two weeks or so and we've really had a bunch of salmon um people have noticed that the water in the underwater camera is pretty cloudy like here is nice and clear um but earlier i know i was looking at it and it was pretty cloudy and that's because of all the nutrients that are released into that water so that's a combination of salmon taking their reds sending up nutrients into the water um also just bears eating the salmon and all of those nutrients being washed into the water so it makes the water murky um, it makes the water more turbid and you don't get to see as clear of a view when you're watching the underwater cam um, but it's because there are a lot of nutrients in there um, and so salmon are actively shaping that with shaping their reds and changing you know the composition of the riverbed but also sending nutrients into the water yeah, the salmon are, are essentially cleaning the riverbed of fine sediments mm -hmm. each and every year. Uh, it's it's fascinating to consider how how these fish have such gigantic impacts on the watersheds that they mm -hmm. inhabit. Um, you know, through their nest digging, through the nutrient cycling process that they impart, um, and there, there seems to be pretty good evidence that there's a it's um, there's like a feedback loop associated with this. If you want to have mm -hmm. large runs of salmon returning to a watershed, you need large runs of salmon to be there already because those nutrients are cycled throughout the food chain, starting with the plankton, then um, or the algae, and then the plankton, and then the baby salmon that feed on the plankton themselves. Uh, so without large numbers of fish returning and bringing back these nutrients from the ocean, we may not have, you know, uh, or a watershed may not be able to support large numbers of salmon fry, the juvenile salmon in freshwater before they go out to sea. Uh, to live for several years and uh you know we're coming up on the conclusion of our broadcast right now almost an hour uh and as you know as we think about bears as ecosystem engineers and the changes they impart on habitat uh, i i want everyone at home also to consider how the presence of bears can cause change for the better of their home habitats uh, felicia and i you know, tried mm -hmm. to talk a lot about that uh, and so if we're protecting habitat for bears we can play a part in helping bears fulfill their ecological roles 
And as a group, bears can be considered an umbrella species. So giving them space to exist ensures that a lot of the other animals in the same landscapes also have the room to survive. So bears, they're not passive observers in the processes happening around them. They're a physical force for change that shapes habitat for themselves and other organisms. And I want to thank Felicia for uh, joining me today, Felicia, and also for um, bringing up this topic of conversation. This was a fascinating one for me to research and, and, and help present. So thank you. Thank you for having me. This was a really fun one. <laughs> My co-host for this live chat today was Katmai National Park Ranger Felicia Jimenez. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. We have a bear cam play-by-play -play coming up tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. if you are in Alaska. Uh, so you could do the math no matter where you happen to be, but we'll be back talking about brown bears tomorrow. Thanks for joining us today. And as we like to say at explore.org, until we talk to you again, never stop learning.